All right. Uh, yes, I'm Seth. Thank you guys all for being here. Thank you to Cassandra for hosting and thank you to development for giving us all a chance to, to share this stuff. All right. So we all know that there are lots of diverse tissues in nature. And my big question that really gets me stoked is trying to figure out how do changes in basic cell processes give rise to those diverse tissues. And now if we want to study that, um, typically what we need to do is to sample cellular data from many species. But cell scale morphological data are really labor intensive to collect. You know, for all of us, it can be a ton of work to collect that data from even one species or a few, let alone from hundreds or thousands that we would need to do large scale macroevolutionary comparisons. But what I have found in my postdoc is that it can be more tractable if we collect cell scale data by observing the extracellular matrix instead of the cells themselves. So the extracellular matrix called the ECM, I'm sure you've heard of it, you might even study it, but some folks don't think about it too much. So I'll just let you know that ECMs are all around us. These are a bunch of species that I, that I study right now actually. But the more important thing is that when you look at these species of insects, everything you see on them is an ECM. Also, ECMs do a lot of important things. They hold tissues together, they mediate tissue physiology, they protect tissues from the environment, they can influence morphogen signaling, and they can serve as the substrate for migratory cells. So just studying the ECM is, is intrinsically an interesting thing if we, if we care about how animals work and how they develop. But also we can use ECMs as a tool to make inferences about the shapes and behaviors of cells during development and evolution. So today I'm just gonna talk about one of the tissues I study, which is this, the insect egg. And um, I'm gonna tell you a few things about that. And actually the most important thing right now to know about the insect egg is actually eggs are delicious. Um, I love eating eggs and I'm in good company with many, many other organisms who love to eat eggs because eggs are full of energy and nutrients. It's, it's everything you need to make an entire body. And so that means a lot of critters out there would love to eat up some eggs, which means they need an eggshell to encase and protect the developing embryo inside. Also, this eggshell mediates gas and water exchange for the developing embryo. And lastly, eggshells are just astonishingly diverse. Um, this is especially the case in insects. So what I'm showing you here is a subset of a large data set I put together from the published literature. Um, this was inspired by work I actually did during my PhD in the lab of Cassandra. And so these are all scanning electron micrographs of eggs, and they have all these different variations on their surface texture. And um, entomologists think that a lot of these variations have to do with those ecological pressures I mentioned earlier, parasitoids and predators and changing environmental conditions. So I can take this large corpus of scanning electron micrographs of the eggshell ECM from lots of species and then treat it as a data set. So before I do that, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about how the eggshell forms. So each egg forms in this organ-like structure called an egg chamber. And the egg chamber is a single layer uh, epithelium called the follicular epithelium that surrounds and supports the oocyte inside, which is gonna go on to become the mature egg. And if we zoom in on this epithelium on just one cell, um, I can show you that the apical surface of this epithelium is what's facing the oocyte. And then this epithelium secretes the, the eggshell ECM onto the oocyte. And I'm gonna use eggshell ECM and ECM basically interchangeably today. After it secretes it, this epithelium is shed and it eventually dies. And it leaves behind, in many cases, footprints of those overlying epithelial cells. So these cell imprints then present us with an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to study variation in this egg and its eggshell at different scales. So you can study the whole egg, the tissue scale, or the cell scale, or you can zoom way in and study this ECM at the subcellular scale. For those of you who study fruit flies, you might notice that I've omitted some, some specialized structures on the egg. That's because I'm not gonna talk about those today and those are actually not shared across all insects. So I'm just gonna focus in on um, this kind of the, the part of the egg that is shared across all the insect eggs that I've studied, which is basically the middle part of the egg that's covered in this 3D ECM. Okay, so with this data set, what can we learn? Well, one thing we can learn is that these polygonal cell imprints are present in lots of groups of insects. And also they are absent in some of them too. So the first thing we did is to reconstruct the evolutionary history of polygonal cell imprints. And what I'm gonna show you is a big tree and that tree will be colored according to two traits, whether there are cell imprints or whether there aren't. And so this shows you we got a lot, a lot of data, a lot of genera, and I'm gonna zoom in to highlight a few findings. One is that 
the last common ancestor of insects likely had a smooth ECM on its eggshell. But there've been at least a dozen independent gains and losses of these cell imprints. So that's what I'm showing you with these, uh, these red branches that are showing here. Those are independent gains. And then this other part of the tree, there's several independent losses of this trait. So, okay, we got this trait that comes and goes. What else can we learn about it? We can also learn that the pattern of these surface heights has changed dramatically. So for these species, these are all four different species, they have imprints that are roughly the same shape, roughly the same size, but they vary with respect to this topographical map. What I think of as like the, the miniature landscape of these little planets. And what I infer from this is that the cells that are secreting these ECMs are doing so in a way that varies along some you know, radially symmetric axis that has some coordinate system that the cells know about, which means these cells are changing their 3D shapes of the ECM um, in spatially specific ways that it would be really interesting for us to understand because we actually don't know very much about how three-dimensional ECMs are structured, especially those that are produced apically. So it won't surprise you to learn that the mechanisms underlying ECM formation are experimentally tractable in Drosophila, and that's where I do most of my mechanistic work. Here's a zoomed in image of what the Drosophila ECM looks like. And um, it's amazing, the cells are gone, but you can still see these high fidelity records of where the cells were and the, and the shapes of their apical surfaces. And this is work that I'm doing in collaboration with some folks at the University of Chicago, uh, especially these guys, um, along with Sally Horn Badavinik and Edmund Rowe. And now I'm gonna introduce just a little more about some nice reagents we have, then tell you some things we learned with them. So before I do that, I just wanna mention that the eggshell is actually secreted in layers onto the oocyte. It's kind of 3D printed down by the apical surface of these pink cells. And there's this inner layer that's composed of 3D pillars, like the pillars you know, holding up a, a roof and they have orderly spacing to them. And we can highlight them with the protein that's the main constituent of these. I've got an endogenous tag labeled a superfolder GFP of this protein called CP7. And when you zoom in, you can see that these pillars are actually arranged in interesting and spaced patterns. Then on top of that next is this outer layer that I'm gonna show in turquoise here. This is labeled with a different protein and it forms something different. It forms these ridges at the cell-cell interfaces. And it also has you know, textural features happening in the areas over the medial parts of the cells. So with these tools in hand, um, we can start asking questions. And one thing we can do is to figure out where the ECM proteins are coming from. And this is uh, an arrangement of cells from this epithelium and a subset of them are going to secrete a labeled version of the outer protein and the rest won't. Here's what this looks like. So you see these ones before, here after. So just some of the cells are secreting labeled protein, the rest are secreting unlabeled protein. So this is all wild type, but the protein was only secreted by these ones that are highlighted. The cells are not visible, but just from the ECM, we can learn things about how the secretion and movement of this protein works. What we can see is that it's, it's actually secreted very locally and assembled very, very locally at a subcellular scale which we interpret to mean that the ECM structure is determined by the apical morphology and localized secretion of those overlaying cells. All right, so then we wanna ask, what are those cells doing? And to do that in Drosophila, I used a tissue specific RNAi and overexpression screen. And to do that, I identified uh, all of the, ooh, ooh, some candidate cell processes that might have any plausible effect on this ECM structure, found genes that are essential for those processes, and then, you can increase or decrease their expression just in this tissue, just during the time of eggshell expression, eggshell formation. And when you do that, we can use these two um, transgenic lines to then quantify lots of traits very precisely. So these, these labeled lines allow us to assess subcellular scale traits for this ECM. And then with this screen, we can ask certain questions, right? Which cellular processes can alter ECM structure? And what are the readily accessible axes of variation in the tissue? So as I mentioned, we can quantitatively characterize the ECM and specifically I'll show you about these ridges. What can we do with those? So I wrote some software tools that can extract and summarize the data from lots of these ECM ridges. And with these ridges, we can, you can ask things, you know, like how concentrated is protein at the ridges? What's the width of these ridges? What's the continuity of the ridges? And with such tools, we can learn, for instance, that um, adhesion and apical basal polarity both affect ECM ridge morphology. What I'm showing here is a uh, control tissue and some samples of different tissues of the same genotype. And on the y-axis is the enrichment of this ECM protein in the ridges. And on the x-axis is the breadth of the ridges. And now I'm just gonna show you two other genotypes from the screen um, that both move 
the tissue into a different part of this two-dimensional morphospace, so to speak. So you can change cell cell adhesions, or you could change the apical basal polarity, and you end up with ridges that have different traits. We can also alter um, the 3D shape of these ridges. So if you if you alter the apical basal polarity, you can find out that the ridges have actually become flattened. And we can do that by optically sectioning through lots and lots of these ridges, and then you can computationally combine them together. So these are averaged XZ cross sections of 60 ridges. And you can see that the enrichment of protein at the ridges um, has been lost or almost entirely lost in this genotype. Another thing we can do is study this inner layer with these spaced pillars. So this is showing you, just to remind you, the, this is what this protein looks like at a layer that's basically the middle layer of the eggshell. And inside it, it's got these pillars, and these pillars um, are really quite suitable to very precise measurements. So we can take them and then computationally identify where these pillars are. And then afterwards, you can separate them from one another and segment them in the images. And then you can identify their neighbors. And then with that in hand, you can ask lots of quantitative questions. And you can do that for you know, measuring thousands or tens of thousands of pillars at a time. So doing so allows us to learn that microvilli morphology and microtubule stability both affect the size of these pillars. And you can see an example here on the left um, with pink and brown showing two example genotypes from the screen. And they have changed variation in the size and changed averages to their sizes of the pillars. Also, the shapes of these pillars are sort of obviously invisibly different. The eccentricity is what's being measured here. This is another trait. So we can learn which cell processes are involved in affecting subsets of the ECM structure. And then these are basically handles to grab onto to figure out really what's going on, figure out the dimensions of how this complex thing is put together genetically. So I'm gonna end with one last view at the data, which is all the data at once. So this is something that's a little bit atypical for maybe a developmental cell biology project, but it's something I've recently gotten really excited about. So what I wanna, what I'm trying to grapple with is that this high dimensional phenotyping allows us to sort of characterize phenotypes in ways that we typically wouldn't. So what I'm showing you here is um, a heat map where each column is a morphological feature of the eggshell normalized to a zero to one scale for all these different features. And then on the, on the left or each of the rows is an experimental condition, each one of which has had a single genes expression level turned up or turned down just in this tissue during eggshell formation. And what we're seeing here was honestly very surprising. For screens, we typically expect to see a bunch of zeros where you have no effect at all for genes that are unrelated to the process. And then you see clusters of genes that work together in some kind of epistatic you know, sequence where like A turns on B, turns on C, turns on the effector. They might all have similar phenotypes. But what we learn is that when measuring dozens of traits at the same time, we see something different, which is that lots and lots of genes have effects, but those, those effects are subtle and multidimensional and kind of all quite different from one another, or at least distinguishable statistically, which is, changing how I've been thinking about the evolution of complex traits that have lots of different dimensions to them. So with that, I'm gonna close, and I'm just gonna summarize that the insect eggshell, well-suited for covering for uncovering the cellular basis of morphological evolution, and there's a variety of cell scale and subcellular traits that have convergently evolved many times, and some of these traits can be recapitulated in Drosophila melanogaster by altering gene expression one gene at a time in just one tissue. And last, that there are these multidimensional but subtle morphological changes that result from simple genetic perturbations. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank the folks who worked on this project with me, including Sally and Ed, whose labs are shown here, and also my funding. And, um, and with that, yeah, I'll close if there's time for any questions. I'm happy to take them. Fantastic, uh, thank you, Seth. So we've got some questions. So Brad Davidson would like to know, uh, he loved your talk, would like to know if you can assess the tissue level impacts of your experimental manipulation. So for example, are these ECM changes, are they impacting the durability of the eggshell or oxygen water exchange? I, I, I love that question and I'm really excited about it. Historically, people have mostly studied that those traits for eggs. Um, that's what entomologists have mostly been interested in. So there's this long corpus of experiments people have done to see how well gases are changing through eggshells. I would love to basically recapitulate some of those experiments on these tissues. I have not done so. Um, but I, if I start a lab, for instance, that would be one of the things I would love to do. Yeah. Also, there's one more tissue scale trait, which I guess I'll mention real quick, which is that I thought I would get a bunch of traits that change the packing of the cells in the tissue. And in fact, I only found a single genetic condition that did that. So I was surprised that the subcellular stuff could change really readily, but not the like tissue scale, you know, organizational stuff.
Cool. So we, we also want to know here is uh, some of the, is the ECM of the eggshells conserved? I guess this questioner may mean, you know, the, the composition of it. If it's not conserved, could that be an explanation for some of the variation? It's a great question. We know almost nothing about the genomic evolution of these clusters of the genes. Um, for sure, I think these proteins are at least probably arthropod specific. Uh, I can't find easy homologs and other they're like, you know, apical ECMs evolve way, 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 way faster than basal ones, the basement membrane proteins, which are honestly really highly conserved across like animals. Um, yeah. These seem to really specify, like, you know, just change a lot more and they're tissue specific. You can find homologs across insects and people do study them. And I didn't plan on knocking down a bunch of those genes to start with because I thought those would be uninteresting phenotypes. And it turns out that some of the most interesting phenotypes happened when I knocked down the, 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 the chorion proteins themselves. Um, I didn't have time to include them here. Um, the answer is I really don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were changes that could give rise to, to meaningful differences. However, I have circumstantial evidence that the shapes that we're seeing are actually determined by the cells and not by the proteins. So we, we I think I started thinking maybe you secrete these things and they self-assemble into these interesting structures, you know, which could totally happen. There's like self-assembly of, you know, protein complexes all the time into, into these extracellular globs. I think that's really not happening. I think what's happening is that the cells template this, and then they secrete stuff into the empty spaces or the vac the, 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 the soon to be empty spaces, and then that forms the shapes. So I think the secret to the different shapes is probably lives mostly in cell shape and secretion localization and less so in the protein composition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Lara Carvalho would like to know what developmental stage are you looking at? And mm. does this morphology change over the course of development? Yes, it gets, it's right at the end of oogenesis. It's like the last two hours of oogenesis after everything else is done. Um, and these cells are, the cells that secrete at this point are basically professional secretory cells. They're just full of the secretory system. And in fact, the the, temp, the, the genome that they're reading off of to get enough transcripts for tr translating all these proteins, they endo reduplicate just that chunk of the genome like many, many times. And so they're just reading off transcripts nonstop. And it, they're just doing nothing but, but transcribing and, and translating and secreting at this point. It's right at the end. And in fact, actually, it's the last thing that happens before this, this whole tissue is sloughed off. So you could actually sample these, I'm, I'm sampling basically in, in mature oocytes that are d dissected out of the females, but nothing more is happening to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last question, I am very glad that this is the question because I had the same question it's from Jake Lair. And it's, uh, did you have any perturbation conditions that gave you smooth eggshells? Or do you have ideas about why this would have evolved uh, many times? Great question, great question. I, yeah. Okay. Smooth eggshells is the most conspicuous thing that happens to eggs in nature. They become smooth, they become textured, they become smooth, they become textured. And that I have circumstantial, I have, I have a hypothesis that what's happening there is that these, this is an adaptation to protection from basically predators and, and parasitoids. And anywhere where you're released from that pressure, um, I think you you don't need to maintain this, com this complex and costly surface structure. So they become smooth again. We do have conditions, many conditions, where you can become smoother or smoothest um, by knocking down a single gene, actually. Yeah, it's pretty, it seems pretty straightforward to, to, to do that. So maybe it's not surprising that there's lots of ways to make a smooth egg. And also, evolutionarily, it's quite labile. They become smooth many times. Cool. OK, so what I'm going to do, since we had additional questions for Seth, Seth, I'll just post those to you in the chat so you can discuss with people offline. Sure, so that we can to yeah, yeah, so thanks a lot for that, Seth. Really interesting. Yes, thank and you all for coming and thank you for your questions.